computer. Fantastic. Recording again. All right, good. So hi, good evening, everybody, and thank you uh, ever so much for taking a weekday evening and deciding to learn a little bit more about the Prosomnus CALP and discovering um, some attributes of this new low-profile continuous advancement device. I've got a really neat kind of panel, uh, three friends of mine, three people I've spent some time with, and we're kind of dispersed across the country, which is kind of neat. So I'm going to introduce uh, first, we've got a, 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 a sir, I guess I'm going to say he's a first responder in our midst, a, a Neil Seltzer, and I say that tongue in cheek because Neil has spent the last 24 hours in the hospital, just got out. He uh, had a kidney stone that passed. He's out of pain now, thank goodness, but he's got about an hour's sleep was in the hospital and we were certain that Gina was just going to have to do double duty and so would Shujal uh, in the in the uh, webinar tonight. But he signs on and shows up and he's as, uh, he's as Neil Seltzer as ever, for God's sakes. Good man. So we yeah, won't ask you. him too many questions because he says his throat's a little dry, his voice is a little deep tonight, and he sounds like a disc jockey on one of the rock radio stations. So everybody give it up. Neil Seltzer. Thank Love it. Thank you. You Thanks, Mark. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And, and his right hand and perhaps he and, and Jeff Rain's left hand or Jeff Rain's left hand uh, is Gina Pepitone Matiello. And this is an incredible tandem team because there are very few people who are as well trained, as well versed at administering, running, um, being the clinical guide and everything in a sleep practice as Gina is. She's a registered dental hygienist, but she's uh, morphed from hygiene and scaling and calculus to the higher math of uh, titration and millimeter rulers. So Gina, it's great to have you with us tonight too. Thank and, you. And, great I, to be I'll, here. and I'll add an unbelievable teammate and incredible passion. So All right. Brings a lot of good stuff. And and they both represent Long Island. And so we've got the East Coast there. I'm, I've got the breadbasket of America. I'm in the Midwest. So I'm just north of Detroit, Michigan and Rochester Hills. And then also with us representing the West Coast tonight from San Jose, California, Shujal Shah. And, and uh, already still in his office, you can see his background still masked up because there's some other uh, team members around. Talk about dedication to our profession and being able to contribute and do everything. And, and really, um, all of us are also working on a research project together at the same time, so it's kind of neat. We've been communicating all that. But Neil, why don't you and Gina first, and then Shujal, tell us just a little bit about your practice and something like that, and then we'll go ahead and roll into this and get started. Okay, cool. Thanks, Mark. So uh, welcome, everybody, and um, it's a privilege to be here and share all this stuff with everyone tonight. Um, so I personally have uh, been involved in um, treating obstructive sleep apnea with oral appliances for just about 30 years right now and uh, okay. kind of can tell you I've probably used every appliance known to mankind. I've probably fiddled around with them, taken them apart, married them, played with them, bastardized them, you know, and so uh, this is, you know, where we've gotten is incredible over the years and um, a little about our, pra our practice. Um, I actually still have a dental practice. Uh, so we have two uh, practices under one roof. We have our dental practice and our sleep practice. And um, Gina is really our, our front person there. She's um, invaluable. I mean, she's running the show there. We're involved, of course, with every patient together. And what I really like about working with Jeff and Gina and myself is we have three heads that look at every patient, essentially. We all know, you know, we get to add to that. We discuss them. It's a, it's a lot of fun. And um and we and we we do it nicely. I, I'm proud of the team. You know, so almost like second and third opinions all at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 really. I mean, it's uh, different views. Or also, we we familiarize ourselves with each patient, so that let's say that I'm in the office that day and Dr. Ryan isn't or Gina is. We all kind of know the patients and they're comfortable sure. with seeing any one of us. And um, and it's great, you know, collaborating. You know, what do you think of this? What, which appliance would you like to use here? Blah blah blah. You know, so. Um, yeah, we've created a good little a good little team. All right, perfect. Gina? Yeah, so as you said, I am a dental hygienist. I've been one for about a little over 30 years. And about 10 years ago, I transitioned my profession into dental sleep medicine with the help of my husband, who's a severe sleep apnea sufferer. And um, he's also a firefighter and 9-11 survivor awesome. and part of that has to do with his breathing and respiratory disorder struggled for years with um, not able to use CPAP and eventually after doing some research found oral appliances and 
I truly credit an oral appliance to saving his life and our marriage. And once I was able to see what happened to him and our life, I just jumped into it. I started reading, studying, taking every course I could take and uh, was lucky enough to talk Dr. Seltzer and Dr. Ryan into hiring me. <laughs> and um, it's been a great decision for not only me and my career, but for all the patients that I get to spend a lot of time with and see them really, you know, grow and develop into healthy, happy people. So awesome. It's a very rewarding career. And, and kudos to your husband and thank him for serving and all that he does. That's fantastic. Will do. That's great. Shujal, you have, you have changed locations and removed your mask. I figured the background noise was just going to be too much. So I, <laughs> I finally got some sense and just moved. Okay. Um, yeah. So I've, uh, uh, my practice is also dedicated to, um, not also, but is dedicated to sleep um, only. And it has uh, for the last several years, I got into this field about uh, 10, 11 years ago, um, almost immediately out of dental school and uh, just fell in love with it because of my background in engineering um, and it's just been a blessing. I think, you know, working with companies like Prosomnus and, uh, and, and also coming up with ideas and testing their products and things like that. And so the collaboration has been amazing. So excited to be here. Thank you so much. And, and I'm Mark Murphy. I'm the lead faculty for clinical education at Prosomnus Sleep Technologies. Um, my, my sleep background goes back to about 30 years ago. I was teaching with Keith Thornton at the Pankey Institute teaching an inclusion course and Keith got me interested in sleep, treated that for a while. And then really coming back around to it in 2012, uh, working on a team with, with Len Liptak and Dave Coons and Sung Kim and Heather Whalen, who are all here. Um, back in like 2012, we were inside Microdental in the removable prosthetics department developing a sleep device. Laura Shepard was there. We had a great team and we worked hard and, and came out with some of the first devices. And you've seen the different iterations. And I wish I could tell you I was uh, uh, very important in terms of the development of the devices. Nope, not much. I, I would give them feedback. I would wear them. I was a prototype wearer, not a prototype developer. I'll give that to Sung Kim and Dave Coons. They were the uh, creative geniuses and all that. Um, I'd like to start tonight with a pretty simple premise, in, and that's um, we get asked a lot, like, what does C-A-L-P mean, and what do you mean by P-H, and what is the select? So I thought we'd just take two minutes here and go through our, our nomenclature. So we chose this acronym development thinking that it would be a little bit clearer so that, and, and we do think it is, when somebody is not familiar with our language, it's weird. But the moment you hear our language about the different devices, then it starts to make sense. So we really have three types of devices, the CA, the PH, and the IA. And each one of those tells you something about what device it is. CA, a continuous advancement device. So there'll be a, it's a dorsal style device with a jack screw on the side, and it's going to move an element forward and push the mandibular uh, uh, platform forward. And then CALP, continuous advancement, ah, low profile. That's what we'll be talking about tonight. PH, and I think low profile is kind of self-explanatory. <laughs> and then PH is a HERPS device. That's what the H is for. But we really want to put the P in front of it because at Prosomnus, it's really all about precision. That's what the precision engineering design and milling is all about. And then the IA is the variant that, you know, sometimes if somebody's not used to our devices, that, that'll be a little different for them. That's the iterative advancement, I-T-E-R, iterative advancement. So, and the IA select is, we really probably should have called it IA LP because it's a low profile design. So if you look at the CALP and you look at the IALP, you'll see some similarity in their design characteristics and features. And so the IA is interesting because instead of a jack screw or herbs bar uh, tube or something like that on the side, you actually trade out the arch and put another arch in where the post stays in the same spot, but the platform has moved forward a millimeter uh, on the lower or moved backwards on the upper so that in essence, you're advancing the mandible by trading out the trays. And so then we have a couple more um, issues like UA means unlimited arches. So with the uh, CALP, you can get additional arches. With the IA and the IA select, you can get additional arches. And so it's a, it's a way that you could say, um, how far do I need to advance the mandible? I don't know, but you won't be limited by a three or a five or a six millimeter, you know, kind of an advancement mechanism. And then the MOG and the MOG MIP are 
Um, the AADSM's language about morning realigners is MOG for morning occlusal guide to help guide the patient's occlusion back to their MIP position. And the MIP version is one that instead of just a ramping piece of milled acrylic, very precision in the anterior for the patient, it's also a, got a little platform in the back where you can actually make contact with the teeth. And that seems to be the preferential one that most of the people are ordering when they decide to order a MOG or morning occlusal guide. So that's our nomenclature, so you know what we're talking about. So if we say something about the CA versus the CALP, and that's going to be a little bit of our conversation tonight, because we did have a CA, a continuous advancement device, which was smaller and stronger and a lot of different things, but wasn't quite what Neil and Gina and Shujal wanted. So another revolution came, and we'll tell that story in a couple of minutes. So really, it starts with this. Why would the world need or want another dorsal device for God's sakes. Everybody makes one or two or four or five and you can get them in pink or blue or red or I'm surprised there isn't one with a unicorn horn sticking off the front. Uh, you've got somewhere the advancement mechanism can move, somewhere the elements on the top or the bottom. There's all kinds of variations. We don't need another dorsal, do we? Well, it turns out we did because we had first come out with the Micro 2, which you can see that it's sort of morphed into this IA that we have, this iterative advancement. And I remember being at sleep meetings and people telling us that'll never catch on, no one will ever use it. And now it's incredibly widely prescribed in the United States, North America, and, and now it's stretching out to some other countries. And one of the things that, well, Neil, you were instrumental, weren't you, in saying that until we branch out and add something like a dorsal where you could do micro titrations, wasn't that your... Well, I, I had originally met um, Dave Coons back in, uh, I hadn't met him, I sat down with him back in, uh, I think it was 2017 in, yeah. at the Boston Boston yep. meeting, and I said, um, you know, it's very frustrating, I want to use your products, but we have such a large part of our practice requires what I call micro titration, you know, Absolutely. these little things. And it is amazing how many patients have to be at that specific point without that that micro adjustment, they're either uncomfortable or we can't mm -hmm. reach the point that helps them. Yeah. So uh, I, you know, we were talking about the uh, iterative IA and it's swapping them out, but that jump of one millimeter for our practice really wasn't practical. And he and I, I hear you. talked. And, and here's the thing. I mean, it is kudos to your company that you, you are some of the best listeners <laughs> in any business I've ever dealt with. You listen, you go back to the drawing board, and you come back with something and it's uh, it's impressive thank you and, for uh, thank you for saying that I, I know that i think dave might be getting close to owing you a, a bottle of a very special kind of scotch too because you've made a, a bet about the popularity of ca and and it probably didn't come true with ca but maybe we're going to see it with calp so i think you're going to get your bottle of scotch but what we heard when we were listening to people like neil and shujal and gina and all the other people that were out there using different kinds of dorsals is they like the idea of this micro titration and the advancement but they were big they were bulky uh, if they had a soft liner and it gunked up, uh, they were uncomfortable. They didn't have enough range sometimes. The, they would break. All devices where they, which have mechanical parts are going to break. Even IAs will break under extreme force. There's no question. There'll be challenges with lip competency. And, and, and heck, one of the other companies, you know, there was a recent development of a fulcrum strap that went across the front with a little beak in the front of a device that's out there that's pink in color. So I think you know what I'm talking about. And, and when they came out with that, they said, this is such an improvement over all of our other dorsals. And they made a great big deal. And I thought it was kind of funny because they beat up on all of their other dorsal devices saying, this is such an improvement over it. And, and I thought, well, then what are your other dorsals? But you know, that's the point. All the other dorsals were big, bulky and hard to wear. And so thank you for saying that we listen because I think we did because we don't just go into a dark room and let Sun draw something up on a computer and Dave do the science and Len figure out how it gets paid for and Heather figured out how it's going to get marketed. Yeah. And I wear it. We ask you all. And, and so that's, that's an important consideration. So Gina, Shujal, well, you know, you were involved in some of these voice of customer meetings where we had many of our doctors come in and tell us things they wanted to see. So tell us a little bit about your experiences with some of those voice of customer meetings that we had to find out what were the inputs for design that you wanted to hear about to make a better dorsal, not just another dorsal, but a really prominent dorsal device. Yeah, I can, I can speak to that first. I mean, I, you know, I think I want to uh, just uh, reiterate what Neil said. When I went to my first voice of customer meeting, 
I was just blown away with how much uh, the company, how much Prosomnus and your team members were, were willing to listen. And, and then from that meeting, how much you guys put into uh, put into practice and you know giving us the devices that really work for our patients. Thank um, you so the, much. Uh, yeah, it's it really. I walked away from that meeting just completely blown away and a different impression of of, uh, of this company compared to all the rest that I've worked with in the past. Um, with the um, uh, with the IA device and then the um, the CA device, one of my biggest concerns was just uh, lip closure and competency there. And the bulk of the device uh, was certainly a factor for me, um, just like some of the other um, some of the other dorsal devices, especially when they're protruded. Um, you can you know if you if you have a patient with a with a narrow facial profile, you'll notice this the most, where it really just sticks out and it visibly looks uncomfortable when you do the fitting for the first time. And, you know, fortunately, most patients just are willing to try it and they don't say anything about it. But, you know, sometimes as, as practitioners, we we feel bad and we wish that we had something that was better that we could offer them um, uh, so that they can wear at home. And I think the CALP for me um, was an answer to that because it, it gave that lip closure. The angles of the wings of the post and the screws are, are done in such a way that it just doesn't stick out, you know, straight facially or, or, or buckly. Um, but it really goes to the contour of the of the arch there, and that was that was beautiful. And then I of course love uh, the scalloping. I actually have a I have a device with all of my you know to show all of my patients. So I have one right here. But I can I think when you see it in person, you can really see the angle of the um, of the screw mechanism and the post there, and then the scalloping on the device as well. Um, it's just been amazing for my patients. Thank you, Shujal. Yeah. Appreciate that, Gina. I agree, and. One of the things that I find most helpful in our practice is we're seeing the patients physically every day. We see how their mouth moves, how they're speaking, what uh, size tongue they have. And we know specifically if we could just design a device for every person individually, exactly what they would need. Gotcha. And over the evolution of the CA from the beginning when it first started, when we first started using it, I've actually had several conversations with Sung, even calling me on my cell phone saying, you know, what exactly is, are you looking for in the shape of the mouth? And, you know, what is bothering the patient and what do you see moving forward? And the fact that they spend so much time for me as a dental hygienist and willing to listen to what we are seeing in our patients makes all the difference because we're able to deliver a better product to our patients, make sure that, you know, they are able to wear it comfortably because especially with other alternative treatments, if you can't use it and you can't tolerate it, you can't wear it, it's not going to work. And, you know, all the decisions over the evolution of these devices have come to really, you know, be beneficial for our patients. Oh, 100%. Yeah. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. So um, with that in mind, we did come out, and, and all of you have mentioned, we did come out with a CA. And so our, our first venture into taking our platform was we created a platform. We used the same platform, so we had the same precision fit. We had the same precision for the initial starting position, all of that, and we were able to put a mechanism on the side, and we were able to create our version of a dorsal at closer to 90 degrees, and it would give you the micro titration and everything like that. And even though that device might have been smaller than some of the other ones out there, not everybody was as pleased with that device as we wanted it to be. So if we call that CA, like the CA was uh, our CA 1.0, then the CA, I thank you for nodding. That's exactly how I think about it. It's CA, and then we said, okay, this is what you told us. And maybe we didn't interpret everything the right way because we still got some feedback on that one. And so, you know, and that's what I heard all of you saying is, so we still had some issues with lip companies. We still had some issues with the posts. And Neil, I know in your office, you had a great deal of breakage. You had, you had patients who would take that lower element and ram it right up into the screw area. And that's where a lot of those yes. fail. You, you eat those fail sometimes right at delivery, correct? Exactly, exactly. We, yeah. As a matter of fact, I think it was one of the earliest first CAs. We were all excited, you know, ha having been involved in the sort of the development of it and, and we were so excited. It was like launching a rocket and yep. watching it just go up and crash. Sure. It was sure. frustrating. So, so, uh, so some of the things that are that are present in the in the low profile version and, and 
all of you have mentioned little aspects of it, but let's let's talk about some of the things. What are the things that you like so nicely? You know, the Shri Jai, you mentioned the tapered posts and they're tapered in more than one dimension. And then the, the profiling, you know, the, the anatomical profiling there is not just like taking a denture and a, and a burr and sculpting and characterizing the denture by hand and guessing where the teeth would have been. That's actually a software that was developed for us. Uh, we developed it where you could take the patient's existing anatomy and extrude that out from where the teeth were. So yes, it's a little bit bulkier because it's got some thickness to a millimeter and a half or something over the teeth, but that's the patient's own anatomy extruded out. So we don't have any additional bulk. So that anatomical splint, that's, as we call it, is a real, real advantage. So, you know. It's smart, it's smart, you know. Yeah. So what is a lot on the um, maxillary portion as well, where the muscle attachments are mm -hmm. in the vestibule, I find, initially with other dorsal devices, it was irritating patients. And with the CALP, you don't really have that issue anymore, which is a big thing. Right. Now, uh, can I add that, you know, regarding the breakage, uh, again, you guys listened, you know, we were having this frustration and each time it came back, it was just more, I just want to say smarter, you know, a smarter design each time and, and, and designed to minimize that breakage. As a matter of fact, uh, we've talked about this and on one of the other webinars, there was some study, there's a study in the middle of um, being, you guys are going to submit it soon, uh, where there are some uh, good studies in some private practices now where the numbers are showing compared to most other appliances, how minimal the, the breakage is on this appliance. And as a practitioner, you know, trying to run a business, that's incredible because chair time is our most expensive uh, overhead. And, you know, if you have to deal with breakage and disappointment and building your reputation, these things are, are, are really detrimental. So having an appliance that is predictable and reliable is invaluable. Neil, you're, you're so right. Thanks for mentioning that. That study, which is to be published, um, has literally thousands of uh, patients, uh, a wide variety of devices, a wide variety. And if we even if we segregate out just the wide variety of dorsals, um, they looked at two different incidents. And that's what you were referring to is at delivery, um, where they had to have intervention at delivery or intervention post delivery. And anything that required time outside of the normally scheduled delivery and normally scheduled follow-up visits, they would add back and compare it to the other devices. And they found that the average devices compared to Prosomnus were about five times more um, intervention time. And as you said, chair time at, you know, four, five, six, eight hundred dollars an hour is crazy when you start to add 15, 20, 30 minutes. So this was, uh, this was a good innovation. And it also, it, not only is it chair time, but your reputation. You know, people go back to their referring physicians. They tell them, oh, this thing is a piece of garbage. It breaks. It keeps breaking. It's very embarrassing, you know. Hard to earn physicians all, trust with we're, broken devices. Absolutely. We're, we're all trying to do that. And you need good equipment. You know, you need good, reliable stuff to do it. Amen. That's, I think that's a one of the things. Us. One of the things when we are on our delivery appointment, that I love to hear, and this happens always with especially CALP, is the patient goes, oh, it doesn't feel bad at all. This isn't what I was expecting. <laughs> and then I'm in my head, I'm like, yeah, this is great. So um, just the initial reaction, because patients aren't, they don't know what to expect if they have never worn any kind of uh, orthodontic appliance or mouth guard or anything. So once you know, their expectations are a little scary. We place the device in their mouth, it drops right in, and, you know, they have that light bulb, like, oh, I, I think I could do this. So it's a big help. Yeah, yeah. well designed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. I had two patients yesterday um, who both started with Herb's devices, and then they, they received CALPs from us, and uh, they came back for their first follow-ups, and both of them said, this feels like, like I'm not wearing anything at all. Uh, which is which is amazing. Yeah, they felt naked. <laughs> they talk about taking the mask <laughs> off and feeling naked. So yeah, they felt naked without that big bulky device. And yeah, I totally get that. Totally get that. Listen, um, comfort equals compliance. You know. Oh, so. yeah. amen. Absolutely. And, and, and really, that is one of the strong suits we've got when we think about the effectiveness of oral appliance therapy. We know we don't quite have the efficacy 
that CPAP will have, but we know we really get to win on the adherence and the compliance side. And so it's, it's critical, for, critical for us to make smaller, more comfortable devices and smaller, more comfortable devices that minimize side effects. And we can't have a lot of breakage and intervention appointments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I, I can't say that stuff enough. Um, Can I know, just ta sure. say one more quick thing on breakage? Sure, absolutely. The fact that you give the uh, additional mandibular device with the L3, the mm -hmm. three millimeter post, mm -hmm. that also makes a big difference for us because there are some patients where we really have to start out you know, very conservatively. And with other dorsal devices, as you're advancing the maxillary post, they do have a tendency to break and get weaker over time. Right. So being able to pull it back and then transfer to that L3 is exactly. uh, very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, is Neil, something I, Neil, you I like wanna... to talk about the physics right up yeah. there, don't you? Between yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Well, what Gina, what, what Gina <laughs> just, what Gina, what Gina just alluded to is, is again, this thing is brilliant. And, um, you know, imagine or understand that the leverage arm created by moving that screw block out, Every time you move it out a tenth of a millimeter, that leverage arm becomes larger. And then, of course, if you understand physics and levers, the, the torque that you could get on that arm is incredible after Absolutely. a while. And that's where, you know, traditionally all these all the companies were making, oh, look at how far we can advance it. But you advance it out four, four millimeters, you have this incredible torque on there and it breaks. That's why they break so often. Now you have a situation where with the, the swapping out of the lower tray uh -huh. and, 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 and micro adjusting the block on the top is a great combination. You never have to come out in our office. I mean, I know you have a three millimeter advancement, but in our office, I'm trying to do, you know, if you go out three tenths, five tenths, uh -huh. seven tenths, and then if you have to hit 10 tenths, just swap out the, swap out the lower post and bring them back to zero again. So totally. you're never really having that, that arm, out to a point where we, you know, really puts it in jeopardy. So yeah, that's on, on this slide, I think about the 12 millimeter potential advancement range. Now that's gonna always be limited by, is there enough a maxilla? Is there enough tooth surface to put, you know, all of the different posts right. where they need to be? Totally limiting factor on that, I get that. But certainly easy to get the six range or the nine range. And, and I think about that, can you imagine sticking an arm out, not just five or six, but seven or eight millimeters? That's just asking right. to snap off, you know, it really right, is. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, and that with all the other built-in stuff on your platform, you know, the the bilateral symmetry, incredible, and you can elaborate on that, Mark, if you want. Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, yeah, I've got a picture of that later. I do. You're yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, Shujal, did we lose you? Or are you still there? I just noticed your picture went away. I just want to make sure you're still okay. Everything good. Yep, he's at the office, so something might have come up, so we'll roll with that. So yeah, the, 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 this particular slide is one of those call-out slides that Heather creates for us in marketing uh, for the team to bring to light some of the attributes. Um, as nice as all these attributes are, I would say that every one of these is some sort of an answer to the question, what if? When, when Neil or Gina, Shujal or any of the other dentists that we have, we even have some physicians that are in those voice of customer meetings, as you know. And, and we, fortunately, we have them in nice places, so it's at least reasonable to do. But you know, it's the question, what if we did this? What if we did that? Could we do this? Could we do that? And, and I love it because Sung always says stuff like, everything's possible. You know, everything's possible. We're a software company that happens to make oral appliances, and we want them to be patient-centric. And so it's a question of what can we and can't we do. So talking about creating you know, a, a more advantage lever arm so that we don't break those, can we do that? Yeah, we can because in our precision world, we can just trade out the lower arch and put the post three millimeters forward. And you just can't do that in some of the other environments. And so it allows us to make a device that's got a lower profile, but has a stronger kind of a, a advancement mechanism. And the, the thing I like, and, and you've been doing this long enough, and you were, I, I'm almost positive you were the first site testing the CA version when it first came out and probably the first site testing the CALP when it came out, Neil. So you know, you've got some of these devices you've been looking at for quite a bit of time, and yet I'm pretty sure you're not seeing a lot of gunking up in these, are you? No, no. This uh, material is outstanding. You know, you, you guys, w whatever the magic is there, it's a, it's a clean machine. <laughs> Gina, how about you? You interface yeah. with so many of the patients. Are they surprised at how easy it is to keep clean? Or 
Yes, that's one of the things I speak about when we deliver the device is how to clean it. And very often I'll find myself saying, you know, it's probably the easiest device that you can clean. And it seems to always stay very nice and uh, shiny and clear. You're not going to pick up stain or anything like that. Uh, so it's just, it's easier to take care of. And that's another thing that you know, helps with compliance as well. So they don't have to spend a lot of time doing that. And then also for me as a dental hygienist concerned about, you know, the oral cavity and all the bacteria and biofilm that builds up in there. So we want to make sure that the patient still has a, you know, healthy mouth, healthy teeth, healthy gums as well. Yeah, I got, I got a funny one for you. Dr. Sure. Ryan just uh, texted me to remind me, um, <laughs> Not, all, not, all, not only were we uh, early in on this, but he's the first human being to have it done to. We made, we made a CALP to him, and he just texted me and said. So remember, the proper term for that is we call that animal testing. You know, we test it on animals first. <laughs> right. So he's like, yep. He was, no, um, well, Dr. Ryan is not an animal. He's actually electronically uh, built, right? Yeah. There you go. Uh, He's, cyborg. He's, a cyborg. He's a cyborg. Yeah. He's a cyborg. He's some kind of a droid or something. I love it. I love it. Yeah. We've, we've got some new photographs. Um, uh, Dave Coons, who does a lot of the uh, claims research for us. And it's funny because he and I get to work together. He's, he sets, he and Lynn set me on tasks to measure the width, measure the height. And, and the way we measure the volume on all of these, that's why when I say like, this is smaller than, you know, I uh, will order up devices from different manufacturers all to be made for my mouth. And then they, they come here and that way the other manufacturers don't get mad that they're making a device. They get paid for it. We pay the MSRP and everything like that. And then we take the devices and I measure them in all kinds of dimensions. But the real acid test for volume is we take the device and we dunk it in water and we measure the volumetric displacement of water, the Archimedes test. You know, it's, it's not brain, sure. brain surgery, so they let me do it. And we do that and we find that like even with the original CA, it was smaller than any of the other devices. But because the back was still squared up a little bit, it looked bulkier, it still had a little bit more um, thickness in the anterior from a lip competency standpoint as the IA does versus the IA select. And, and I don't know that we would have minded that too much if that's all we had. But because we had the IA select version and you look at that and you're like, holy cow, I want that on everything. And so, you know, you see a pH that looks a little bit lower profile, a CA that looks a little bit lower profile, and we continue doing that. And it's really the magic of the material. And this material is, again, it's, it's not brain surgery. It's control cured PMMA. And, you know, there are a couple of other manufacturers that are using uh, control cured PMMA and milling it. But if you mill it and then hollow grind out the inside, you've lost all your precision and you put a soft liner in. I'm, I'm not saying the soft liner isn't comfortable. Of course it is. But by the time I hollow grind that and put that in, I've added bulk because I've got to have thickness for the strength of the platform and then thickness for the soft liner. So I, my joke is there's always a trade out you have to make for everything. There's always a trade out and sometimes they're worth it and sometimes they're not. But this material has been really robust. But some of the new slides, when you see them come out in an article near the end of the year, because we've got some new materials we're looking at and we wanted to test those to make sure that they were as color stable and stain stable and bio gunk stable as, as these were. And they look just as good under a scanning electron micrograph. So that's kind of important. And they leach less monomer. So that strength allows us to make them a little bit differently. Neil, this is, this is your slide because you asked me about this. So I've got this in there. We talked about this the other day when we were getting ready for this. You talked about this bilateral symmetry and, and that's totally correct. Um, I remember you know, there's so many great um, origin stories I could tell you talking to Sung and Dave about the development of these devices. And this one's fun because Sung would explain to us that you could have on the right side of somebody's mouth, it goes in this direction. And on the left side of somebody's mouth, it goes in this direction. And I'm exaggerating. So if I make a platform by hand, or even if I milled the platform, okay, but then I just stick on the attachments, I stick on the advancement components, right onto whatever mother nature gave me in terms of my arch form, my right side and my left side could be cattywampus a little bit. That's a scientific term, cattywampus. And so that's what it's showing here is this is just looking at um, if you displace the screw and, and jack somebody forward one, two, three, four, five millimeters, and a, just a five degree difference between the right and the left, that's the difference in the advancements. And you're really taking the mandible then and you're doing this. And I'm exaggerating that movement again. But the idea is, well, does that matter? And the answer is, it depends. It depends. So if you're talking about small titrations, 
and tenths and a quarter of a millimeter. And, and, I, and I'm taking somebody when I'm doing that cockeyed like this, then I'm going to bet that's going to matter in that patient's mouth. So can you speak to that, how important that symmetry is for you to be able to have that? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly why I brought it up. I mean, to know exactly where you want to be, you want to know that if you want to advance two millimeters or three tenths of a millimeter, that that's the number you're actually advancing them in that, in that direction uh, anteriorly, you know, and you're not canting off to the side somewhere. Yeah, you know? I always worry about temporomandibular discomfort in those kinds of course, of, of course, of course. And we've had some, our challenges with TMD, you know, patients and, um, yeah. you know, some of them, what were you going to add, Gina? We wanted something? just to mention that uh, another thing I say to our patients is when we're talking about TMJ and the temporomandibular joint is the only joint in the body where both have to work together in conjunction with one another. Every other joint is separate. And I try to explain to them how the device works. That's another aha moment for them. And they're like, oh, you really are thinking about these things. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I never thought about that before. Mm -hmm. So, so, th so this is a, this is an example, um, where, where if I, if I, in the upper right hand corner, the pink one, that's a handmade device. So, and when I use the term handmade device, I'd really be thinking to myself that that's a device, um, that was, um, certainly made on the models and you all have seen the precision data. It's in this month's DSP um, article talking about, I want to get you back to the original bite position. And so we can do that very accurately with this precision engineered CAD cam kind of world we live in. But um, so you could have a cold cured made handmade on some sort of a wristulator or, you know, Gilletti articulator, that kind of a thing. And then that's an example of where when you strap the device on the side, if the arch form comes around and it's a little bit more, uh, uh, sharply angled like that, that the advancement device could actually go out into space. And so when you want to talk about breakage, even if you don't have that arm very far advanced, because it's canting away from the arch form, it's just easier to break. And we actually uh, mill, I, I was going to say cut a groove, but they engineer a groove into the side of the device there to keep everything aligned perfectly. So this is an interesting picture. Right. This is a device. Uh, the one on the left was uh, made by a different manufacturer for my mouth. And the device is a milled platform. But you notice right away that the advancement component seems to be a little different color acrylic. There's a little bit of a yellow tint to it. And what, what's really happening there is that's a milled platform and then they strap on the two advancement arms. And, and my mouth's pretty symmetrical. So that's really not a big issue because my right and my left side are almost the same. So if you made mine by hand, it's probably not gonna be the end of the world for me. Just try and get them in the right spot. But look at those two advancement arms, they're about five millimeters difference in length. And so as you start to advance that, even if it's put together well, because they made the advancement arms by hand, one is actually larger than the other and it's on a milled platform. And then the milled platform you can see is much larger in terms of tongue space and everything than that than what you see on the Prasomnus platform. So that, that tongue space, that there isn't a better picture than right there. That is two different milled platforms. One by a manufacturer that mills the platform, but it is not precision. So mill does not mean precision. And then a precision milled platform. And then it's very patiently centrically designed because it's got all that tongue space. That tongue space has right. got to be crazy important for you. The other thing, like you were saying about how you contour the external to be somewhat like the shape of the teeth internally there, you Absolutely. guys have figured out a great, uh, you know, the retention mechanism is great so that you don't have any tooth movement. And, um, you know, uh, I had the privilege to going uh, over to Prosomis when I was out in California and, um, mm -hmm. you know, watching the technicians design uh, on the computer right where, you know, let's say the height of contour of the tooth and, and, and bringing that over and, and the minimal amount of, of lateral forces on things are just really, really, you know, impressive, you know. And speak to the concern of patients as well with when they, you know, hear other people using oral appliances or read anything about them. They're always talking about uh, tooth movement and jaw discomfort. And those are two of the things that we are pretty comfortable saying to our patients when we're using a prosomnus device that you're going to have minimal, if any, tooth movement or jaw discomfort. So that's another plus as well.
Yeah, definitely. You've got that the tooth thing. The tooth stability is fantastic. Yeah, we we do have that study that was done uh, really with the IA platform, but the platform is the same. You know, the advancement mechanism is what changes. Um, where we had a two year study where they overlaid them. They took new scans, overlaid them. University of Pacific did this. Um, Gene Santucci and Nicholas Ferranius, and they overlaid them and there was no st statistical difference between the tooth position over a two-year period. So I think they're looking at repeating that at three and four and, and that kind of thing. But Neil, you had a, speaking yeah, of TMD great. patients, you've told me uh, an interesting story about a lady with a very sensitive uh, temporomandibular joint who might have required micro, micro, micro titrations. Can you speak to that? Right. So, so, you know, every once in a while, you know, it's funny, you never know which patient is going to turn into one of these endless cases, you know, I mean, <laughs> and they are, they are endless. And, uh, you know, obviously we're in the business to help people. So we have to, exactly, we have to adjust and, and do the right thing, of course. And so uh, there was one, I, you know, sort of a world record holder in our office. I adjusted her one tenth of a millimeter every month. I experimented where I would go out two or three tenths too much stress on the joint, she complained. So we started every month. I did 16 adjustments. <laughs> it took me 16 months to deal with. I mean, you know, that's a little insane, but she couldn't tolerate uh, the CPAP. She was getting some advantage to wearing the appliance until we reached what we considered our, our maximum position and our optimal position. And uh, it was a little insane. It was certainly a, a financial loss, but it was, uh, it was a great story. She was happy. She referred people. Uh, her physician was impressed. So the overall gain was there. But uh, without that technology, without the ability to do those micro adjustments, we wouldn't have been able to help her. You know, I mean, it would have been uh, just a disaster. You know? I, I would have been very challenged to have the patience that you all must have had to, to treat her. Um, There's no doubt about listen, it. Listen, after a while, it was simple. You know, we knew we were going to go. With t it's a 15-minute appointment, you know. And I don't, in our office, I mean, everybody, every practitioner can do things the way they want. We we do most of the adjusting, almost all of it, uh, unless it's something like swapping out an IA tray that they have mm -hmm. at home. I mean, but the patients tend to forget what they do. They don't do it correctly. It's, it's not worth the... Uh, all the side agita that I would get from it in our practice. So, um, Trujal, any interesting cases uh, like that with you with TMJ patients you've had to adjust uh, endlessly? Yeah, but you know, Neil, I will remember your 16th appointment <laughs> case so that I never feel bad when I'm. Oh, well, forward, when you get you know? to 12. When you get to 12, you're going to go, no big deal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was really, it really became an easy thing. And we were doing such a good service for her. And like I said, it was impressive for the physician. So, you know, it was a win for us in a way, you know. Yeah. I think that's the difference between working with ProSomnus and other manufacturers that they, the way we treat our patients and the standard of care that we want to provide ProSomnus allows us to do that by listening to us and helping us with our cases as well. And in a, a case like this patient that Dr. Seltzer is speaking about, there may have been a time where she wouldn't be treated because nobody really understood the right thing to do or had the patience to do it or the proper device that they can do it with. And then she may be left without anything too. So it makes a big difference in our patients lives and I think when they know that they're definitely much more compliant and willing to work with us too. Yeah, I mean she she had you go, I was just gonna say she had no she was at the end of a rope and I wanted to help her and it was you know it's the big deal really when you come down to it, you know. Sure. Mark, you know I will just add that there are dentists who are always going to be concerned about um, the one millimeter jumps in, you know, in standard like select or IA devices. Amen. And so in my mind, the CALP is kind of the best of both worlds where you get the, the form factor that you want, the very slim, narrow uh, form factor that almost feels, you know, for many patients, like they're wearing nothing at all. And then you get the precision that you need with the screws. Um, and I think what's most amazing is how you can advance uh, so much if you need to, you know, I have patients who can advance six, seven millimeters and report that they don't feel like their jaws move forward at all. Right. And, um, and, and so having that ability to switch out, swap out that lower tray and go even further is just amazing. 
I agree that that flexibility and the precision of that flexibility is important. That one of the one of the um, I never had the 16 adjustment case like you did or the tenths of a millimeter, but I did have a, a patient that was actually my daughter's mother-in-law and uh, CPAP failure. Her husband wears a CPAP and we put her in an appliance and she loves it, feels great, doesn't snore that night. And after about three or four nights, she starts to get some sore jaws and we couldn't get her past that with trying to inkle into that. So we moved her backwards a couple millimeters and that wasn't enough. We moved her back four millimeters. And so it did take me, it took her because she was able to adjust herself, but it took her probably about four months to come back to zero, zero where we started. And that was with an IA, you say? That, that one was with an IA rather than a CA, yeah. Yeah, and that's where, for me, it gets frustrating that you have these gigantic increments. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in this Clearly. game, those are gigantic numbers, you know? Yeah. millimeter, it's And amazing. for sure, for sure. For her, that, mil yeah. you, 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 I was asking yeah, her to jump a over a, a gap that she could, she just could not manage it. You're 100% right. We talked about that case. It's, a, you know, she would have been uh, well treated by starting in a more retreated position and having smaller titrations. Absolutely, certainly. For sure, for sure. Um, and Gina, it, uh, you and I talked a little bit before about, um, and I said, could you talk a little bit about your normal titration? Do you have the patient titrated? Do you titrate it? And I remember your answer was really a good one that I think everybody should hear. So talk a little bit about your normal, if there is one, titration schedule you have for patients. <laughs> so I would say my normal titration schedule is really very individualized. So no one person has the same titration schedule. We really have to know how their muscles work, how you know their lifestyle is, what they're able to tolerate. Some patients need a little more coddling, some don't. So you have to kind of really know your patient and individualize. Generally, we're going to follow up with them within a day or two just to make sure they're okay, and then usually within a week or two. But um, some patients need to take a little longer. Some patients we trust to give the key and do a little on their own as well. So again, um, it's very individualized and I think it, it just makes a lot of sense to spend more time understanding the patient and their needs and really gear the titration individually toward them. Amen, thank you very much. That's, uh, I, I think that's wise wisdom. And when I've gotten a little too dogmatic in my protocol, that's when I run into a problem like I did with my daughter's mother-in-law. I've that's just, right. you know, to doom, to doom, to doom, doing the same thing over and over again and, and expecting that to just, uh, you know, create an experience for me. Um, let me uh, put up a couple of logistical things that I want to take care of. And then I'd love to get to some of these questions and see if there's anything else we want to talk about. And just a, a couple of points uh, here at the end. Um, the, the Prasomnus has asked me to talk to you very briefly about there's a couple of really good initiatives and, and they've done this before in the past and it's been really successful. There's some really good things that uh, they have going on for everybody at the end of the year and, and really I'll give you the sales support team's uh, information, contact information on the next slide. But uh, this was very successful last year. I think, uh, I don't know, it was 50 or 60 or 70 iPads and iPhones and stuff like that. And, and this year, I think there's even some other um, possibilities in terms of what they can do, but it's a finished strong program whereby increasing what you might be doing year over year um, from quarter over quarter, rather last quarter, this quarter, the number of uh, cases you do. And so Kimberly works for me. And, and even though I work for Prosomnus, um, I have to come out and earn my rebate. I have to come out and earn these same sort of things too, just like anybody else. It's really fun. They, we've, we established that in the early going. So we're excited because this particular quarter, we weren't that terribly busy in Q3. And I only have to do a reasonable number of additional devices in Q4. I don't know what I would do with another iPad. That's not the point, but it would be fun to get one. So, so um, what I'd really rather get is an iWatch and that's on the agenda as well. So we've got iPhones, iPads, iWatches, all kinds of i stuff you can get, um, but just by increasing what you've done. So the, the final, final thing that I'll say before we start to talk about questions is, um, Jerry Vogel, our VP of sales, has a very, three very capable people in Michelle Bryant, Greg Vogel, his son, and Brandon Wolpman, and they're on tonight. And then they've got a team of people spread out across the United States. So their contact information is up there for you in the Eastern Central Mountain Pacific time zone and the Wendy's up in Canada uh, exclusively. So 
those are some contact informations. And I, and I would ask you to reach out to them on two fronts. One, if you have any interest in the Finish Strong program, it's uh, an innovative way and it doesn't take away from whatever other rebate program you're on or anything else like that. And then the second thing that's kind of fun and interesting is that they probably can conjure up some sort of a, a way for you to get a chance to try the CALP. I won't say anything more than that, but reach out to them. And if you haven't had a chance to try the CALP, or if you tried the CA and are ready to do the CALP, or if you're using some other sort of a, a device that you think might be a little bit bulky or have a, a more difficult time with lip seal, or you see some breakage, you got more adjustments, um, give it a try based on the kinds of things that you've heard tonight. I think that would be, uh, that would be great. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, first Mark, give you all closing, closing thoughts from the three of you, and then we'll take some questions. Neil, go ahead. Mark, Mark have you thought of uh, with the rewards program, uh, Scotch? <laughs> well, I think you deserve, I, I don't know if Dave's on the call tonight. I don't think he is, but uh, I, I think you deserve at least maybe um, uh, a blue, you know, that's not the most expensive <laughs> one, but that's a few hundred bucks, right? Isn't it? How much is Johnny yeah, Walker yeah. Blue? That's that's got to be pretty. Uh, about about a hundred, about one hundred and fifty dollars. Well, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. I know I got to get. I, yeah, I have. I, I I don't really drink it, but I, <laughs> but I, I that's, that's my just, guess. You, you know? just want it on your shelf to brag about, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, I know when we're done here tonight, I'm thinking of having either a glass of wine or a, a, a maybe a little Manhattan or something like that because I've had a long, hard work day. Started early and and uh, finishing late. Um, All I can drink right now is water. There you go. Uh, uh, Len Liptak, my CEO, always jokes that because he tends to work late and I tend to uh, get up early. And he, and this is not, this is not any exaggeration at all, but there are times when he's emailing me or I'm emailing him and I'm getting up at four, three thirty or four o'clock in the morning. And he's just getting ready to go to bed and sending off another email. And suddenly he gets a response from me because I'm up and I see it hit my phone. And he's like, He's thinking to himself, you're up this late? <laughs> or he'll call me at 7.45 wow. or 8 o'clock at night, and he'll go, I'm, are you still up? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. And I'm in bed watching Wheel of Fortune, for God's sakes. I'm 64. Gina, how about hey, you? you? Any, live, man. Yeah. Any closing thoughts or remarks? And then, uh, for y'all? Uh, yeah, I have two quick things. One, sure. I would like to say to all the attendees that are listening that uh, I call ProSomnus my dream team. They are really there for me every step of the way, any call I make. And there's a couple people in particular that I talk to a lot. The communication, the way I'm able to explain what my patient needs and design wise, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, even time wise, all the things that we really need, they play, pay close attention to that. And I'm really able to have very close communication with a lot of my dream team members there. So I really appreciate that. That's a huge help in treating our patients. And then the other thing is uh, being a dental hygienist and sometimes kind of the only dental hygienist in the room feels a little awkward sometimes, but I would like to say to all the dentists out there, you know, we are looking in our patient's mouth every day we are have very great comfortable relationships with them so help us to screen the patients you know show your hygienist what to do what to look for and know that your hygienist can not only you know clean teeth and take care of your patients uh, dental health but they can also save their life if they have any you know symptoms of sleep apnea so amen you know, we can help you out with that too and we, we in our practice we actually have another hygienist who's been training under gina and, and dr ryan and myself and she'll be doing what gina does her name is amy and you may have met her mark uh and she um she's coming along nicely and uh as we're expanding we're needing other people internally so she's going to jump in at some point and um yeah, having a team like uh, ProSomnus with us from their, you know, their sales team, uh, field reps, whatever, yeah, and, and all the way up to Len have been, uh, it's amazing. I mean, I could call Len and it's like, I can't believe that I'm, I'm getting to talk with someone up at the top and he's so responsive and listens and gets back. So yeah, kudos. It is. It, it, honestly, it's it's amazing. And, you know, it's a, it's a big enough company and yet it's a small very close knit family. It really is. It's uh, I, I, I feel like it's my dream to my love working with it myself. Mr. John. Yeah, I, I would agree with Mark on, on that. You know, it really feels like a small company because of the personal attention that we get. Uh, it's quite amazing. And, and how much you guys listen to us in developing these products uh, for our patients is, 
is excellent. Um, one other thing I'd like to add is that um, because of some of the questions, it seemed like we're coming from, uh, we have a few dentists um, on the webinar who might be new uh, to oral appliance therapy or uh, providing therapy for sleep disordered breathing. I would say that this, the CALP is really kind of a no brainer device to start, you know, to kind of get your feet wet and start using uh, because of all the benefits and options and uh, flexibility it gives you in um, in the care for your patients. So um, if you're going to be choosing one, you know, Prosomnus has many devices that they offer, but um, if you're going to be choosing one, this could be a, a great one to pick uh, first. Yeah, and for somebody who's new, the, the only time that you probably can't use a device like this for a patient is if they're Medicare, um, they're going to need uh, either, you know, one of the PDAC approved designs, which are you know, pretty much limited to a Herbst style design, or a tap with a hook in the front. There is one strap device, which is a printed nylon with a big tube in front, the Oventus O2 that got PDEC approval. Um, but you did hear something that was interesting as you heard Shujal say that he was replacing a couple of herps. Now, I don't know if they were Medicare PDEC herps, but um, we've had some patients who've had a herps and they're not particularly fond of it. And I say to them, and, and the beauty of this is if we've scanned in our, our um, arches, or even if we take an analog impressions, Prosomnus is holding those digital files for you. And I've said to them, you know, that's not a problem. We have these other devices and I show them the one I wear and I show them the one I like and I show them the smaller ones and I've got all the models there. And they said, well, that looks a lot smaller. That looks a lot easier to wear. And I go, what well, usually is. And so sometimes there's the opportunity and I hate to use a term like upsell, but as long as I fulfilled my PDAC requirement of making them a PDAC approved device, they could buy a second or a backup device for cash. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's an opportunity. So I don't know, were those uh, herbs that you were replacing for a Medicare patient or were they somebody that was just had a herbs? Yeah, no, both, both were Medicare patients. Yeah. There you go. So, so that's a, that's it's actually, we probably have, you know, maybe 30, 40% of our Medicare patients um, then pay a discounted cash fee to get a second device of their choice. Yeah, I agree. It is, it is discounted. Um, it, and, and probably if we could get Prosomnus to make it, if we knew we were going to have it and make it maybe at the same time, uh, maybe we could get a discounted price from them. <laughs> That'd be kind of mm -hmm. cool. That would be nice. <laughs> I just got fired. Anyhow, um, <laughs> so, so here's one of the questions coming in. So does this mean that the advancement device is set so that the arch comes straight forward? And the answer to that is yes. Better than that. I, I spoke in two dimensions about these angles like this. It's also, you could theoretically, this is exaggerated, have one going up a little bit and one going down that torques the mantle. You could have pitch and yaw. And so in, think of it as three-dimensionally, I'm going to be able to advance that mandible as I desired. I'm going to start within one millimeter of my starting position or the only device that can achieve that and then come directly forward. So that's a real advantage to be able to do that very, very accurately. So that's great. Um, so, so uh, let's see. Oh, and then there's a couple of questions about some military applications. That's great. Talking about durability and strength. Yeah, the military is actually um, largest client of Persona Sleep Technologies. Um, we make so many devices for the military. They've got this mantra about uh, nutrition, fitness, and it's called their uh, readiness triad. And it's nutrition, fitness, and sleep. They've recognized that sleep is such a significant factor for performance enhancement. As many of the athletic teams have, the Chicago Cubs a number of years ago when they finally won a World Series after such a long drought were the first Major League Baseball team that monitored their, uh, their patient's sleep. Um, it's comfortable, Curtis is saying, it's comfortable to hear that the panel recognizes TMD issues with OSA, absolutely. Um, he's practiced both. Um, uh, what, what about options for yeah, what is, is not an option for dealing with daytime TMD issues. We're doing a study with Zephyr for the FDA approval. We found that roughly 5% of the patients needed daytime support in order to wear their Prosomnus devices at night. So yeah, that's, I'm not surprised by that at all. And so we, we do have a couple of, we didn't show them at all in the uh, acronym bingo that we were playing over there. Um, but, um, and I don't know who won the acronym bingo. We were calling out the letters I A C A P H bingo. But, um, but we do make a couple of, uh, uh, airway centric appliances, which are intended for daytime wear, which allow you to bring the mandible forward. So that's good. Um, so let's see. Mary. Mark, can I just throw, I'm sure. um, sorry, Dr. Murphy, can I just throw a just quick Mark, thing in please. there? It's just Mark. <laughs> um, we have also had several patients this year 
that mm -hmm. have allergies to certain types of acrylic. And we've oh, uh, ordered, okay. that's something that uh, we have the ability to do. We can order from ProSomnus a test kit and the patient can have it allergy tested to make sure that it's safe to use. And in those few patients, um, all of them were able to use the ProSomnus device, even though they were, they were actually allergic to polymethyl methacrylate. Wow, that's, that's great yeah. to hear. And, and of course, you know, with it being such a small leaching, almost immeasurable amount of leaching because of its density, um, mm -hmm. that does not surprise me terribly. Uh, I had one patient who was uh, allergic. She ended up moving just before we could do a device for her. And I was at the time wrestling and thinking, well, I was going to make her a nylon device. It was be simple as that because I didn't have many other choices. Um, but uh, she ended up moving just before I had to do that. So that doesn't surprise me. There's just not enough monomer to leach out. Good. That's good to hear. Thank you. Um, great question here. Why um, 80 degree posts instead of 90 degree posts? And I see you know, it's great in the chat room. Some of these questions you can answer. It talks about the technical clinical knowledge base of the um, sales team. They're not, just, they're not salespeople filling out order books. No, they, they come in highly trained to talk about practice management, closing more cases, doing all kinds of things. And one of the things, Neil, when you were having the breakage with the original CA is that plowing straight in. And once they created those radiuses, they put just a tiny tilt on it like that. It would also help steer it away from that mechanism. So that's really a little bit of a guiding angle to help prevent the kind of breakage that we see really across all dorsals. I mean, we're going to have breakage across all dorsals, not just, uh, just that. Uh, let's see. Good stuff there. Is right on. Mark looks fat on TV. Thanks for that. Um, just joking. Just joking. It didn't really say that. And just checking the Q&A box, making sure you've got all that. Uh, can you have a copy of the slides, please? Absolutely. If anybody emails me, um, I'll be happy to send them a copy of the slides. So M Murphy at prosomnus.com. M Murphy at prosomnus.com. Any contributions, contraindications for this device? Um, I, I, I'm almost positive that if somebody was nickel allergic, nickel sensitive, they'd still have to be a little bit concerned about um, the screw mechanism there. I am nickel sensitive. So when I got my knees replaced, for example, um, I ended up with the titanium ceramic versions of that. Um, I will add to that, um, yeah. Mark, is that I, for some period of time, I was very concerned about using these devices on patients with, um, you know, veneers or extensive porcelain work in their mouth. And, um, you know, until I started having certain cases where I had to do it. And um, uh, uh, Johan at the lab and Sung were very, very confident that, uh, you know, you have nothing to worry about, Dr. Shah. And so uh, we did it. And so far, no problems. And I continue to, to make these devices on patients with veneers. Uh, we just indicate to the lab we want to block out certain areas, but um, have not had an issue at all. So that that is not a contradiction in case somebody thinks it is. That's great. Uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, um, it's interesting. I'm nickel sensitive. I said that, and I realized just now that prior to this new um, material device that we're testing right now, I've been wearing regularly my CALP. And so my CALP is a very comfortable device. I love the uh, small design. Because I'm so big, I'm always worried I'm going to break it or something, but I haven't, so that's encouraging. But I guess it actually has nickel in it, and I don't get any kind of a reaction to that. So that's, yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Um, it is 804, and so I'll, I'll stick around and answer any additional questions. I just want to bring up one more very small minor point. Um, as you look at the Persona sales team down there, my sales rep, uh, if I think of it that way, is Curtis Sterneman. His dad's a dentist and practices dental sleep medicine in the Chicagoland area. But today, of all days, Curtis, it's your birthday, isn't it? So happy birthday to Curtis Sterneman. You're online right there, buddy, and, and I wish we were Happy all birthday. in the room together and we could sing and embarrass you or do something like that. Back from his days, he played uh, college football for uh, one of the big schools, and that was kind of exciting. So he's a pretty good-sized fellow. He makes me look small. I always I always make him crouch his head down when he comes into the room or anything like that. So any last-minute questions, any last-minute thoughts? I think we've, we've gotten most of the big ones out of the way that we can. Anybody can email me, please, for the slides or anything else that you want to do. Um, so uh, Bettina's, Bettina's got one question I see here, and I, I can tell her I had a patient like that, too. She said she's had a problem with calculus buildup. Ah, Gina, did you get a little smile on your face? Calculus buildup on the internal of some of her devices, and what do you do about that? Well, it's interesting you should say that, because I haven't seen much of that at all, but just about 
maybe six or eight weeks ago, we had a senior patient come in and, and we've been doing almost everything telemedicine that we can. And he wanted to come in for his one year follow-up and he comes in, he's one year and he's got a pH. So he's got the same platform we're all talking about, but it's a pH instead of a CA. And he's got quite a bit of calculus in there and he's a little embarrassed about it. And he said, I wonder if I wanted to come in in person. He said, cause I want to see what can I do to clean this out? And of course there's these tartar solvents, right? That you put them in a special, uh, I learned about it in the office that day, put them in a plastic bag and in a cup and in the ultrasonic cleaner and like magic. Am I right, Gina? Like magic. Yes. 20 minutes later, that thing is brand new. So any other tips or tricks, Gina? They got to brush them better. They got to clean That's them better. That's what we taught them. That's what we taught them. I, I think as a hygienist, I, I go over home care as well on their own teeth, aside from how to clean the oral appliance. And I tell them that mandibular anterior and maxillary buckle is a very common area where you're going to build up a lot of tartar. And so I show them how to clean it a little bit better. And I say it is very important for them to clean their mouth floss before they place the device in their mouth. And I also hear from patients that they get better checkups from their dentist because of that. So oh, cool. just keep the mouth cleaner and uh, the device will stay cleaner. So let's take this one final question and then we'll sign off um, and email me and, and Tiffany's got that question about the soft liners and um, she wishes we could incorporate a soft liner into the device. And, you know, it's, it's a thing that we worked on on our voice of customer meeting. And what we really got down to when we were talking with our doctors about voice of customers, they loved our precision. They loved how well these devices fit. They loved that there wasn't any tooth movement. Precision was king, but everybody wanted, I'm going to change the wording of soft liner to an easier, more comfortable delivery mechanism so that it was easier to fit for the patient and more comfortable. And so that's really what we've hoped to achieve with this lower profile version of, uh, of the IA, the IA Select, and the lower profile version of the CA. And uh, there's likely to be some more innovations in the future as we go forward of materials that maybe will allow that, but we probably won't do, a, at least I can't see them developing anything in the foreseeable future that would be a soft line or just the, uh, the bio incompatibility, the gunking up, the staining, the delamination, all of that stuff. And we lose all of the precision and we get bulkier. So it kind of moves us backwards. And so I think, I think as a company, they want to, how do we find more precision, more accuracy? And that would kind of take them away from it. So, um, Shujal, Gina, uh, Neil, I couldn't have asked for three better panelists. Uh, it's so easy to talk to all of you. I've talked to you in the past. I'm going to talk to you again, I'm sure. So thank you so very much for uh, taking the time out of your practices and uh, answering oh, my pleasure. questions. Really, uh, Prasomnus mm -hmm. is as fortunate to have the kind of relationships with the teams that we work with out in the field who give us the kind of feedback and allow us to be the kind of company that we are. We could not do that without all of you, your patience with us, your, your teaching us, your learning, all of that goes on and the feedback we get from you. It's, it's a real blessing for us. And so I can say from everybody in the Prasomnus family, um, thank you all for being such an important part of who and what we are and our success. Thanks thank for you. having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yep. So thank good you night very to, much. Good night, everybody. Yeah. All right. Uh, be safe. Well. Go to sleep yeah. and get a good night's sleep and make sure you tinkle <laughs> a couple times before you go and drink lots of water, buddy. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Take thanks. Care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your nice, kind words. All right. Talk to you good later. Good night. Thanks. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.